Chapter 9 of 1 Samuel begins the second major section of the book of 1 Samuel. The first section worked around or told us about Samuel himself. Now the second section will be talking about Saul. Now Saul is one of those strange individuals that we encounter in the Old Testament that you kind of wonder, why did God put this person here? It's, it's kind of hard to understand where Saul fits in, but, but we'll, I mean, we'll get there, but we think, God, couldn't you have done better than this? Well, it's, it's really our fault that we picked Saul. So, Saul, John read about Saul. He was the man of Benjamin. Uh, his Kish, Saul was Kish's son. And there's not a man among the people of Israel more handsome. So we have to wonder what did Saul look like, right? And he stood head and shoulders above everyone else. That means he was tall. He was taller than everybody else. But notice in those first two vo verses where it gives us a description of Saul and his family, there's no mention of God. Saul came from a wealthy, influential family and was good looking. But nothing is said about his relationship with the God of Israel. There's nothing said because there was nothing to say. Saul reflected the spiritual state of the nation. His heart was far from God. Saul was not a king at heart. The people wanted a king based on outward appearance. And Saul fit the bill. Good looking, tall, you know, just like me. No. It is this emphasis on outward appearance that places, that plagues our nation today. Because we are controlled by, what are we controlled by? What we see by television. But, but the computer and television. The man that will ultimately lead the country is the man who has good appearance, has television skills. Because we choose a person by how they, they look and talk on TV. If only we had a tool that could reveal the true character of a person. First of all, we'd wear it out, checking everybody out. But then it would change how we did things. Now we get to donkeys. Now the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, had strayed. So Kish said to his son Saul, take one of the boys with you and go look for the donkeys. So he, Saul, passed through the hill country of Ephraim and passed through the land of Shashaha, but they did not find him and they passed through the land of Shalem, but they did not find them there. He passed through the land of Benjamin, and they did not find them. So donkeys were an all-purpose vehicle. They were the pickup trucks of Bible times. Used for transportation, hauling, and farming, they were considered necessities. Even the poorest family owned one. To own a donkey to own many donkeys was a sign of wealth, and of course, Kish had many donkeys. And to lose a donkey was a disaster. So these two were out looking for donkeys. When they came to the land of Zuf, Saul said to the boy who was with him, Let us turn back, or my father will stop worrying about the donkeys and worry about us. They've been gone so long looking for the donkeys. But the boy said to him, there is a man of God in this town. He is a man held in honor. Whatever he says always comes true. Let us go there now. Perhaps he will tell us about the journey on which we have set out. So the town they're talking about is probably Ramah. And Samuel moved to Ramah after that battle with the Philistines that we talked about last week. Saul and Samuel both lived in the territory of Benjamin. So Saul's lack of knowledge about Samuel showed his spiritual ignorance. 
Then Saul said to the boy, but if we go, what can we bring the man? For the bread in our sacks is gone, and there's no present to bring the man of God. What have we? What have we? The boy answered Saul, here I have with me a quarter shekel of silver. I will give it to the man of God to tell us our way. Now the scripture then gives us a side note. See it's in parentheses. Formerly in Israel, anyone who went to inquire of God would say, come let us go to the seer. For the one who is now called a prophet was formerly called a seer. So men who spoke with the dead were called seers. People that were gypsies or, or fortune tellers, seers. God wanted a different man name for his man. So God instituted the word prophet. Samuel, of course, is the man that Saul is talking about. And although Moses is called a prophet, Samuel is the first of the order of prophets that we'll, we'll talk about prophets from here on. And the prophets would go to the king and give them God's word and straighten them out or try to straighten them out. So Saul said to the boy, good, come let us go. So they went to the town where the man of God was. Now the suggestion of Saul's servant shows something about those two men. They seem to me men who wouldn't think to come to the prophet for spiritual guidance, but they did think, hey, maybe he can help us find the donkeys. As they, as they went up the hill to the town, they met some girls coming out of the draw water and said to them, is the seer here? And they answered, yes. There is just ahead of you. Hurry, he has come down to the town because the people have a sacrifice today at the shrine. Now the day... Oh, oh it just happened that Saul and Samuel and his servant came looking for the donkeys on the same day that Samuel was there to do the sacrifice just happened as soon as you enter the town you will find him before he goes up to the shrine to eat for the people will not eat until he comes since he must bless the sacrifice afterwards those eat who are invited now go up and you will meet him immediately so they so Saul's not invited so they went up to the up to the town as they were entering the town they saw Samuel coming out towards him on his way to the shrine now the day before Samuel, or before Saul came, the Lord revealed to Samuel. Now the question is often asked, how did God communicate in the Old Testament? Well, the King James Version gives us a better clue here. The King James Version says, now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear a day before Saul said, came, saying, what I hear in my ear are words. That's the only thing that makes sense here. God spoke to Samuel. Now why can't we hear God speak to us? There are, because you know, we're not listening. We're not trained to listen. Remember, uh, Samuel grew up, dead, his mom dedicated him to God. His whole life was dedicated to God. He grew up in a temple and God spoke to him and he didn't know it. So Eli told him, tell him I'm listening. Tell him. And so he, uh, Samuel said to God, speak Lord for your servant is listening. And then Sam, or God told Samuel something. And from that point on, Samuel obeyed whatever God told him. Samuel obeyed and he would repeat and then tell the people what God said. So Samuel, his whole life was focused on listening to what God had to say. And then not just listen to what God had to say, but then do it. We can hear God tell us something, but if, we're not, if we don't obey, then God's not going to bother with us anymore. So whenever God says something to us, we got to obey. Did you have a question, Gail? Fascinating. That is fascinating because 
it's so clear in Samuel's life how Samuel could listen to God from then on. So we need to do the same. We need to figure out how to listen and then have the courage or the will to obey what God tells us. So God's telling Samuel, tomorrow about this time I will ten, send to you a man from the land of Benjamin and you will anoint him to be ruler over my people Israel. He shall save my people from the hand of Philistines for I have seen the suffering of my people because their outcry has come to me. So when we keep praying, we keep crying, and, it, and there's a verse in the Bible that says, just keep going back to the judge and keep asking and keep asking. So if we keep asking, God may answer our prayer, even though it may not be the right thing for us. And that's what he did for Israel. When the children of God were in the wilderness, they kept crying for meat. And God said, okay. And then he gave them quail and he made them sick on quail and then he sent leanness into their souls so when we pray our prayer should be to seek God's will what God wants us to pray for what his will is if we pray selfishly all the time we may regret the answer that we get now God would indeed give the people of Israel a king. But a flawed king. And even though there were many problems with Saul, no one should think that Saul was a total disaster. Saul had gave Israel many military victories and, and a greater independence from the Philistines. Remember, they're not occupied by the Philistines still, so he gave them a little more independence. So when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord told him, Here is the man of whom I spoke to you. It is he who shall rule over my people. So Saul's walking up to this prophet, doesn't know him. Prophet sees Saul, he doesn't know him. Saul was impressed. Uh, Saul was a man that impressed even Samuel with his good looks and his tallness. Samuel regarded him highly, but later regretted that Saul did not do well. Then Saul approached Samuel inside the gate and said, Tell me, please, where is the house of the seer? Samuel answered Saul, I am the seer. Go up before me to the shrine, for today you shall eat with me. And in the morning I will let you go and tell you all that is on your mind. That would be a little scary, telling him all that's on his mind. Saul must have been amazed. He looked for a prophet, and the first man he asked for the, about the prophet was the prophet. Then the prophet invited him to dinner. Then Samuel goes on. As for your donkeys that were lost three days ago, give no further thought for them, for they have been found. And on whom is all... Israel's desire fixed, if not on you and on your ancestral house. So Samuel proved to Saul that he was a prophet because he showed Saul that he knew things he wouldn't have known if it hadn't been for supernatural uh, information from God. But what was this talk about Israel's desire? Saul didn't know what was going on. So Saul answered, I'm only a Benjamite from the least of the tribes of Israel, and my family is the humblest of all the families of the tribe of Israel. Why then have you spoken to me this in this way? So to compare, we're going to go back to Judges, and in Judges 6.15, Gideon says, But sir, how can I deliver Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my family. So Gideon was telling the truth. He was a coward and he was scared to death because the armies were attacking and they were badly outnumbered. I, was, I think it was like 30,000 were attacking and maybe it was more than that. Gideon, they got the number down to 300 that 
took him back. Never, you have to read that story. But here in this story, Saul had no reason to be afraid. Israel was not presently at war, and he was only there because he was looking for his father's roaming donkeys. There was nothing to prompt his speech about his humility, so it was a false humility. Everything Saul said and did about did was about himself. For example, Saul said his family was the humblest in the least tribe of Israel, but in verse 9-1 we saw that his father was a man of wealth, so he's not a least of Israel. Saul didn't want to face the responsibility that God was giving him. And although he had been called by God and had a mission in his life, which we'll see as we move forward, Saul struggled constantly with jealousy, insecurity, arrogance, impulsiveness, and deceit because he didn't fully give himself to God. Because Saul would not let God give rest to his heart, he never became God's man. He never committed to God. So then Samuel took Saul and his servant boy and brought them into the hall and gave them a place at the head of those who had been invited, of whom there were about 30. So they walk in and this stranger gets the prize seat by Samuel. And in that culture, it's an honor to be a great honor to be seated next to the host Samuel. And Samuel said to the cook, Bring the portion I gave you, the one I asked you to put aside. The cook took up the thigh and what went with it and set them before Saul. Samuel said, see what is kept set before you. Eat for it is set before you at the appointed time so that you might eat with the guests. So Saul ate with Samuel that day. And again, in that culture, every meal had a special portion to be given to the one the host wanted to honor. And Saul was that honored person at the meal. When they came down from the shrine into the town, a bed was spread for Saul on the roof, and he lay down to sleep. Then at the break of dawn, Samuel called to Saul upon the roof, Get up, so that I may send you on your way. Saul got up, and both he and Samuel went out onto the street. And as they were going down to the outskirts of the town, Samuel said to Saul, Tell this boy to go on before us, and when he has passed on, stop here yourself for a while, that I may make known to you the word of God. Now there's two great mistakes we make when regarding God's guidance. One mistake is to think that every life, every event of life is heavy with meaning from God. Though nothing happens by accident, not everything happens for a great purpose. So we can't think that every leaf that turns has huge meaning for our purpose. The second mistake is to ignore the moving of God in our life through our circumstances. Because God does move through our circumstances. God wanted to use this situation to guide Saul and God will often use circumstances in our lives the same way. We need to trust in God's goodness and his ability to make all things work together for good. And what verse tells us that? We know that all things work together for good for those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. So when we love God, we can trust that everything that's going to happen is going to work out to good. Now, as far as the roaming donkeys go, the donkeys were still important animals, important to the family and important to the community. If they had not been found, it would have been a disastrous loss. But in the circumstances, look at what their roamings brought. Saul met people that were lost to him. People he didn't know or didn't even care about. And because of the roaming don donkeys, he was put right in the middle of the kingdom. 
loss may lead to new opportunities. Loss may lead to new life. So we need to learn to trust in God and to love God so that all things work together for good, even in times of loss. Let us pray. God, we don't like to lose things. We don't like it when there's loss in our lives. And it's hard to think that there may be some good purpose out there for us in a time of loss. But we do know that you are good. That you have brought good things to our lives. And that your promise is that you will bring good to all of those that love you. So God, we trust that in this life, in this time, you are working for our good. Help us, God, to listen and to learn and obey and to move forward in that trust and to share your love with others. In Jesus' name, amen.